uh, evening or late afternoon. I welcome at another event of uh, Forum 2000, uh, Societies in Transition. Uh, today we are going to talk about a very hot issue, which is the Middle East. We usually say in Czech uh, Near East because we think that the Middle East is very near to us. And uh, I think it will also uh, be clear after the speeches of my guests and after maybe the discussion that we will have. Uh, my name is Jan Fingerland. I work for the Czech Radio. And uh, my uh, honored guests are Ephraim Halevi from uh, Israel and uh, Mr. Noman Benotman from Libya and UK at the moment. Um, I will give them uh, 10 to 15 minutes of uh, some overview of the problem that we are going to tackle today, which is the role of uh, uh, the security apparatuses in the Middle East and in the countries that have undergone some very dramatic uh, changes. Uh, and uh, uh, then, of course, you will have a chance to, to ask your own questions. Uh, we miss uh, another, uh, a third guest uh, that was supposed to be here with us. It's a, uh, uh, it's a colleague of ours uh, from Egypt. He uh, decided not to take uh, a part in this debate, unfortunately, but uh, as we agreed, uh, Egypt will be represented by uh, countries that are at the right side and left side of Egypt, which is uh, Libya and Israel. Uh, or maybe I will try to represent Egypt here. Um, okay, uh, I will start with uh, 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 Mr. Ephraim Halevi. I think it's a name known to uh, everyone who is interested in the Middle Eastern affairs. He is uh, probably, first of all, former uh, director of uh, Mossad, which is a uh, I think high, high quality uh, agency specialized in uh, secret services and other services. And uh, he is of course also expert in uh, uh, Middle Eastern politics. He has been also a journalist. And uh, I think he, is also, he has been also very much involved in uh, peace talks with uh, Jordan and uh, with some other uh, parties in the Middle East. So. He is a man who has really a lot of things to say about uh, the topic. So, please, Mr. Halevi, the floor is yours. Uh, good evening. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say again uh, what I've been saying the last couple of days, that it's a pleasure to be here, to be attending this uh, exceptional uh, conference uh, in Prague. And... Uh, <clears throat> To say that I knew uh, the founder of uh, Forum 2000, uh, Dutch Journey, when he was head of the um, Czech, uh, Czechoslovak service. And uh, it was a pleasure working with him uh, in the initial stages of the changes uh, in this country. <clears throat> and uh, although the circumstances are different, uh, nevertheless... Um, uh, the service at the time, uh, which was in transition, because at that time Czechoslovakia was in transition after the rapid and dramatic changes which took place <coughs> uh, as uh, the, uh, um, the east, what was east to Czechoslovakia and what was east generally uh, changed so rapidly <coughs> after the uh, dissolution of the uh, Soviet Union. Uh, these are subjects which I think uh, one day will be written up in history. And I think the role of the Czech service at the time in uh, stabilizing the situation in this country will uh, become uh, apparent. But we're not talking about uh, Europe today. We're not talking about uh, the Czech Republic. We're talking about the Middle East. Um, one of the things which has been, um, I think, uh, characteristic of the Middle East over the last hundred years has been the exceptional role of uh, intelligence services and security services, both in the Middle East and outside the Middle East, um, in the history of the entire region. 
Um, not only were the states and countries in the Middle East, uh, as they evolved after World War I, and this is now something which is almost 100 years uh, away, not only were the regimes inside the Middle East, as they evolved, uh, regimes which from the outset believed that one of the major prerequisites they needed, one of them, was to set up an intelligence and a security apparatus. But also the outside world, the, the world from the East, uh, uh, Eastern Europe, Russia, and uh, far into Asia as well, and the West, uh, Europe, and the United States, and Latin America, all of them tried to use the intelligence services in their countries as a major uh, channel for contact and for um, activity of a very, very uh, um, discreet nature, which was very, very essential at the time. It was essential because societies in the Middle East have been in transition for over 100 years. The societies in the Middle East have not uh, yet reached a, a level of uh, stability, uh, which they would have liked. Societies in the Middle East have uh, always tended um, to consider it essential to have a level of clandestine capabilities, which enabled them, on the one hand, to know what was going on inside their countries, and also to control uh, events which might take place and which would be detrimental to what they thought were the interests of a particular state or a particular society. Uh, this is something which is not, as you know, uh, only uh, a Middle Eastern uh, characteristic. There have been other countries and other uh, ages in world history, recent history, where intelligence services have been uh, key players in their own countries. I cite the uh, countries of Eastern Europe, I cite the uh, Soviet Union at one time and Russia, I think, today. I cite uh, China and the way the Chinese system works. And I can tell you that in the, even in countries which are generally believed to be uh, on the democratic side of the, uh, of the scale, like India and others, yes, the intelligence service and the security service are considered to be essential. They're not only considered to be essential in order to prevent uh, undesirable acts. They're also essential because they enable the political powers to uh, promote policies, positive policies, which cannot be done in public. To promote peace, to promote dialogue, to promote... Um, efforts to bring about a better world and a better system. That's why, for instance, we're talking about the Arab Spring. Israel is not part of the Arab Spring. But in Israel, the intelligence services played a major role, a crucial role, in some of the major events bringing about peace in the Middle East. The peace between Israel and Egypt was hatched in Morocco. The key figures there were the King of Morocco, King Hassan II, and the head of the intelligence service at the time, General uh, Tlimi. And after him, General Kadiri. Names which are not familiar to the public, although their roles were public and known. They were able to do things in a positive sense of the term, which would considered uh, religiously um, impossible in a setup, in a setting where religion did not permit either contact, certainly not uh, an effort to peace. When it came to Jordan, 
Yes, when it came to Jordan, the main conduit which brought about the peace between Israel and Jordan was the intelligence channel. And therefore, the intelligence has played these roles in the way that I am stating them. And these roles have not been just roles which have been played in uh, systems which have been uh, autocratic. It's not only in the systems where you had a king or you had a president or you had a general who actually uh, controlled the country or the countries. It was also necessary, for instance, when after the uh, Arab Spring brought about the change in Egypt uh, a couple of years ago, and the Muslim Brotherhood uh, took over the reins of government, and President Morsi became president of Egypt. Essentially, the system remained in place. Here and there, a figure was changed. A new chief was changed. And I'll say something about chiefs of services in a moment. But the essential function remained. Whether it was the army in the past, or the Muslim Brotherhood in the present, or any other system which will evolve now in Egypt. Because the nature of society was such that the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the levers of government could not perform in any other way. And I'm not saying it in a sense of criticism. I'm not saying it in a sense of... Uh, of, uh, of, uh, of dissatisfaction, I'm simply stating a way of life. When it became necessary to reach a deal, which afterwards became public, but had to be hatched in a cocoon of clandestine secrecy, the only way to do it would be within the confines of an intelligence and a security setup. And this also became important because the head of the intelligence services, the heads of the intelligence services, became the main channel for contact between the outside world and the leadership. It was not the, the ambassador to Egypt, whoever it was, who conducted the substantive relationship between any country in the world and the president of Egypt. It was not the ambassador in Amman who conducted the major element of the substance of the relationship with His Majesty the King. And the same goes for Damascus, and the same goes for Baghdad, and the same goes for Tehran, and the same goes for Morocco. About Libya, I don't know today, maybe you'll say something about it, but certainly in the former days, it was the head of intelligence who did it. It was a very sensitive position, position actually which no uh, insurance company in the world would take upon itself to issue a life insurance to a head of service in the, uh, in the Middle East. That was, I think, a, uh, a, uh, a challenge which no insurance company would meet. Because a head, of, a head of intelligence ended up in one of three ways. Either he became head of state in the end, or he spent some time in jail, or very often he was, what was left of him was only the head. Because of the nature of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of this position, because of the nature of what was being actually in his hands. Now I'm telling you all this and many of you people in this room are young people who are not accustomed 
what I've been saying in the last few minutes. And I see looks in your faces of maybe of uh, incredulous uh, faces of saying, no, it can't be that way. But it can, it is that way. And it is that way not because it is an external desire of intelligence services to impose themselves on the body politic. It's because the body politic wants this system to evolve in such a manner. That's why, for instance, in Pakistan, which has now a democratic system of government with a, uh, an elected president, an elected prime minister, the major force is the inter-service intelligence, the ISI, which is the strongest arm of government in the country. Not so much in overseeing daily lives of people, but of guarding the major strategic interests of state. And it is not for us, if I may say so, us, because I think we in Israel are exceptional, we do not belong to this kind of activity, because our system of government is probably identical to the system of government in this country and other countries in Western Europe, But I'm saying that we have to judge the countries I've been talking about, not in terms of how we would like them to conduct their affairs of state, and how we think that our system is the best and the most just and the most free system there is. But ultimately, it's those countries and those societies who have to decide how to conduct their affairs. And even ultimately when they reach a level of, as I said, of democracy, and democracy not a formal democracy, but also a, a substantive democracy, they still elect to use this system in conducting their affairs of state. And I believe that, um, I don't know why the, uh, my Egyptian uh, colleague to the panel decide the last minute to, to leave. But my guess is that some of the things I've been saying now would be very difficult for him to digest. And I guess also it would be very difficult for him to answer to these situations because there are situations which are to some degree uncomfortable to many, many people. But there are two things, and this I'd like to end my, my, my uh, opening remarks, two things which are essential to the Middle East today and will be essential to all the regimes of the Middle East if they want to survive, and if the peoples of the Middle East want to survive in the given environment in which they are living at the moment. And it is a phrase which was coined by none other than the man who uh, established the dynasty in Saudi Arabia, the dynasty of Ibn Saud, who was a remarkable individual from almost any point of view, and we could talk about him in, at great length. A character who was unbelievably um, charismatic in his country, and by the way, who since his death in 1953 which I believe is uh, 70 years ago, I think 53, all the kings following him were and are his sons. I think it's an all-time record, by the way, uh, in terms of dynasties. That in the last 70 years, all the kings who have uh, ruled Saudi Arabia, both the original king, Ibn Saud, and all the sons that followed him have all been his sons. He has said, we need two things to survive in the situation which we are in, which will be a situation which will, we will have to live with for a long period of time. We need security and stability. Security inside and stability in the region. 
And in the service of security and stability, the Middle East has been revolving for the last almost 100 years since the demise of the Turkish Ottoman Empire at the end of World War I. And until a degree of uh, stability is achieved in the region, and this is not, nothing which I believe is going to be immediate, I think we'll have to learn to live with this, <coughs> with all its drawbacks, with all its aspects, but also with the fact that this is, to some extent, uh, assures a degree of continuity and of daily life. Thank you for your very challenging and interesting speech. I think there are so many questions that I would like to ask you, but I think there are also many other people in the audience who will want to ask the same question, so maybe I'll, I will leave it for later. Thank you. And now I will give a, a floor to uh, Noman Benotman. He is, uh, as I already mentioned, uh, originally from Libya. He is uh, currently president of Killiam, which is a UK government funded. Uh, it's, not government. it's not government funded. You claim that. It's independent. Okay, sorry. So it's independent think tank, Killiam, based in the UK. Uh, very prestigious uh, uh, place to be and uh, to work for. And uh, besides that, uh, Mr. Benotman has a very interesting. Uh, CV. Anyone who is interested in that will find it on the internet. He began as an um, Islamic uh, fighter against, uh, uh, against uh, Muammar Gaddafi's regime, but he has been able to uh, find new ways how to do things uh, in his life and in his uh, political life. And uh, I think all this is reflected in his uh, view of uh, the Middle East and of uh, the role of security apparatuses in the Middle East today. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. It's, uh, I would like to capitalize on Afram's point of view, which is, I think, Probably instead of saying the Middle East, we can say the middle of intelligence. <laughs> it's, um, I think, what's so called the Arab Spring in the media, first of all, it's something nice, you know, to attach yourself or crucial events in something catchy to the media to market it. But we know in reality, it's a bit far from Spring because of what's going on now. It's, it's more a tectonic shift. And it's going to change the region for many, many years and decades to come, once and for good. So, talking about the security and military, security slash military sector in the region, a lot of people, they've been um, convinced to a certain extent or maybe deceived by a lot of pictures appearing in the media when they saw in certain countries, including Egypt, members of the security or the military, you know, waving with the public and with the people, smiling with them, allowing them as well, you know, to get into the tanks or armored vehicles, which is not the case before, you know. I think it's, it's really, really, excuse my language, masterpiece of stupidity if we think that's a change. It has nothing at all. It's just like a nature of any human being at risk. So what we've been seen, you know, or marketing to us, it's just like a change of attitude in a particular moment, but it has nothing to do with the values of the military slash security vectors. Why? Because the approach to tackle the issue, it's not within a stable or a peaceful environment conducted by a, a national government. That's what we can call a security slash military sector reform. What happened is a revolution, okay, seeking radical change, and here only Libya achieved that, you know, but it's still 50% because what is missing, the other 50%, okay, okay, what's the alternative to Gaddafi, what's so called Jamahiriya? But in terms of getting rid of the entire state, that's what happened in Libya. But in the other uh, uh, five countries, including Yemen and Syria, 
as Afram said, the system is still there, you know. And the hard core of the, uh, let's say, business as usual, or the routine, how intelligence, security, and the military, they do business, it's, it's still there. I don't think it has been changed. Only Libya, it disappeared. So to find out exactly, is there any significant change happened because of the Arab Spring or not? I decided just to come up with a different framework. So if I may say, allow me to say, I might help you to think of it from a different perspective, very strategic one, which is the Arab Spring brought home the enemy of the security slash military sector in the region. What's the enemy? It's globalization. So it's a very important point to understand these issues if we want, with the help from the international community as well, to reform the security and the military sector in the region. Because the security and the military sector in the region did everything possible to make sure one wave after another of a globalization with all its values and ideas to keep away from the region, okay? Public has no access about what's going on in the world, including about a new theories and concepts about what's the meaning of security and what's the re relation between security state and citizens, and security of whom, and who's the reference point of security. All these things, you know, kept away from the Arab population for many, many decades. But the Arab Spring managed successfully to brought the enemy of the intelligence last military security to the Arab Spring nations, or let's say brought it home. And what's the effect of that? Two main issues. The first one is sovereignty. And a lot of Arab nations, they suffered a lot because of sovereignty. And in any, in any like Arab country in the region, usually, who is the protector of sovereignty? Who's going to protect sovereignty? Who's going to make sure our sovereignty is still there? So can, nobody even can touch it. It's the military and the security service. But what's the consequences of that? It's heavy price in terms of development, human rights, democracy, dignity, you name it. You have to sacrifice all these issues. You can call it like, hello. <laughs> Be complaining. <laughs> So I think it's, it's, it's now because of what's going on. And you can see that either the public themselves now, they interfere heavily in the business of, especially in Libya, which is like 100%, to, uh, to the extent we can say too much, it starts to be an obstacle, rather a positive thing. You know? But even at the domestic level, the population, they involve now heavily. heavily and, the, and, and people, they find out society is not just one block of people. No, it's a different groups of people with different interests, and you have to deal with this reality outside the security framework. And even more important is, from an international perspective, it's paved the way for more influence from Western governments historically engaged with the region. Or if you like, maybe you can say intervened. But it's really paved the way for them, and we can witness now, just if you follow the news on a daily basis, you can see like the existence or the increasing existence of a lot of uh, Western powers in many, many uh, uh, Arab countries, mainly I'm talking about the uh, nations of the Arab Spring, even in state affairs. Who would imagine a Libya, okay? You can see the mission of the UN advising and try to strike a peace between the Interior Ministry and the Defense Ministry in Libya itself, and it managed successfully last year to you know, to organize the first meeting between the two ministers, you know. So, and you take it from there. And other issues has to do with development, the economy, human rights, women's rights, you name it. So it's still there. Before that, it was extremely difficult. Even in Egypt itself, it's the same thing. Why am I mentioning this? Because I strongly believe, maybe you disagree with me, I think when it comes to uh, reforming the security and the military sector, there's no way it's going to happen without some help from the West. Okay? It's because of one reason. It's the know-how. I don't need to spend 300 years, okay, just to understand what happened in terms of reforming security. 
It's out there, but just you need to create a very good, healthy relation with certain government, and you feel confident in yourself in your own land, so there's no problem at all to cooperate with other foreign countries to help you to reform your own security and military sector. And you make it public, very transparent. You don't need to hide it or to make it behind uh, closed doors. But it's uh, crucial. Without a real help and support from the international community, mainly I'm talking about Western uh, uh, governments, it's not going to happen in the region because we're missing a lot of concepts, a lot of ideas, even what's the meaning of security. And if you take it to the next level, what's the meaning of national security? It's a disaster, the answers you will get. What's the meaning of national security? In any given, especially the nations of the uh, Arab Spring because they are heavily, heavily shaken. So, after the issue of 70, I think it's paved the way for something I might call like the, uh, the, the framework of engagement, which is dependency. Some countries now, they are more dependent on Western help to provide security. And don't ask me which countries, but you know, I know exactly. It's heavily dependent, and some of them even with Israel as well. They, there's no way on earth, no way they can survive or carry on business with, as usual without taking in consideration from a very pragmatic point of view to survive this dependency or maybe to make it a little bit uh, diet, interdependency in terms of, of security. I think as someone from the region, it's very positive because that's the main problem, I think, in the Arab region. What's the purpose of security slash military institution, which is very important, but what's the purpose? So now we have, change, we have a chance to, 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 to make like a real, uh, real change. The other issue, part of the globalization, it's the state-military relation. And this is the main problem. Everything happening, I think, in the region because of this unhealthy relation between military and state, military and the civilians. And still until now, there's no significant change happened whatsoever when it comes to this area. Historically, it happened because the military, it was the main or the more organized uh, institution in post-colonialism Arab states after the Second World War. So the military played a major role, not just as a military, professional warriors, no. They were the vanguard of state building. If you read the history, basically, they, they were a very crucial element to build the states themselves, to create the structure of the state itself. So they have a real claim because of this. And then beyond that, when they start to establish themselves and you know, to appear as a real professional institutions, comes the issue of modernization. They play the major part as well in terms of modernizing a lot of Arab uh, countries because the military, I'm talking about 40, 50 years ago, you know, the military was the main institution engaged with the West and they were heavily dependent on the technology comes from the West to build their own military and, and security institutions. And as a consequence of that, some of these, let's say, uh, uh, benefits per truth to the society itself. But again, as a consequence of that, they start to see the states as their own babies. It's mine, it's, it's ours. And you have to respect that. So it's, it's, this is the source of the problem if you'd like to analyze what kind of relation we have in the Middle East between state and, and, and military. So now I don't think it's there anymore, okay? Because the people in, in the five countries regardless of what happened in Yemen and what's going on now in Syria. But they, they, I think, they don't accept anymore. It's been materialized now. If you ask about Libya, Egypt, Tunisia, I think people, they don't accept anymore this kind of, of role because it should be the role of the people. You are coming, okay, you are the protectors of the nation. You are the most honorable people. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I love you, but don't involve in politics because you are not elected. I think it's, it's as simple as that. So for me... The, the main point is, to what extent the Arab Spring is gonna, uh, 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 it's going to be very successful for bringing two issues. The first one is democratic control. Democratic control upon the intelligence slash security 
institutions. The second one, decreasing, I'm not going to say the absence, but decreasing the direct force used to be used by these institutions against the opposition and the public. This is, I think, immediate goals uh, should be part of the, or the consequences of the uh, uh, Arab, Arab Spring itself. I don't want to take a long time about this, but just I would like to note or to bring to your attention uh, three different issues. One has to do with Libya, the, the way how people, they see the security and uh, military establishment. The Thawar, the revolutionaries, which is mainly youth, they think it's something very bad and we will never ever allow that to flourish again. So, but it's creating a real conflict now in the country. Okay, to the extent, maybe it's going to collapse the entire state. But they are determined, and they have a lot of guns to, to make it happen. But they will never, ever allow that to happen. The problem is, most of them, they are unprofessionals. They haven't got a clue about what's the meaning to be a security professional or a personnel. But just they think, we are to war, we destroyed Gaddafi's regime, we suffered a lot because of that for 42 years. And the main source of this problem is the security and military apparatus. So we were never, ever going to allow them to happen. And I'm sure you heard the, about the, the isolation, political isolation law, which is, went even deep than the ratification in Iraq, which is just deprived the state of the entire civil servant. Okay? So this is one issue. But other people in Libya now, because of the security situation now in Libya, they start to think, okay, Let's get rid of the bad guys only, the leaders or the heads of these institutions, and try to recycle the rest of the other professionals, mid-level, low-level uh, uh, officers. But it's still it's not, not, not taking a momentum yet. That's the situation there. And it's very important because the way how the um, Gaddafi structured his uh, 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 security and military uh, sector even the military turned out to be a security apparatus, not anymore a military uh, uh, a professional institution. And that's why the people from the military sector themselves who was left behind during Gaddafi's period, and they don't include in certain units, has to do with security, they are the first people just the de facto, and they just left the, 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 the army and they joined the rebels. But they are very weak, the problem, you know. And the others, which is they really constitute, like, uh, uh, constitute the, the, the real security military uh, sector. Most of them, they've just fled the country. The others just in jail. And the rest just, they, they, they're hiding. And I don't think there's going to be any place for them. But we've lost the knowledge itself, the craft of intelligence, security, and military knowledge. It's not there in Libya, and no one's going to allow that to, to happen. In Egypt, it's different. The military, because it's very professional and one of the most sophisticated and professional institutions when it comes to the military in the Arab world, I believe it's the Egyptian one. It's the equivalent of the foreign ministry as well in Egypt. They, they have uh, traditions, they have history. It's, it's well-respected and established uh, institutions. But from a pragmatic point of view and a very complex network, including outside Egypt, they just decide you know, to terminate the service of Mubarak, and they survive. And now they head back. The funny thing is, a lot of people, they think what happened when they asked Morsi, it's a very positive one, and it's really to protect the revolution itself, generally revolution itself, and they believe, and they said, we were never ever allowed to do that without the help from the military and the security establishment, and now a lot of people, some of them, my friends, well-respected intellectuals worldwide, not just in Egypt, they believe Morsi, he's the only, uh, uh, Sisi, he's the only guy who's going to survive, uh, save Egypt, and he should be the next president of uh, uh, Egypt. And here I'm referring to a very through liberals. Again, a very a genuine through Egyptian liberals. They believe the only guy who's going to uh, uh, help Egypt to survive is General Sisi. So again, it's the idea of the one man, the leader, the chosen one, you know, it's, it's there. In Tunisia, it's different uh, in, in Syria. It's a different, uh, uh, I think, response from the security military apparatus, which is the worst one. Basically, they decide just to stick with the regime, not just because of, I think, uh, uh, sectarian 
issues. I don't believe that. It's for ideological reasons as well. Because they are very strong, radical, uh, uh, pan-Arabist nationalists coming from a Baathist background. So they decide to stick with the regime, and it's not a problem for them even to eliminate half of the nation for the sake of uh, uh, risking the, the, the regime itself. So we have, if you see, three different responses from uh, three different countries or security and slash military apparatus in different countries, the way how they respond to the Arab uh, Spring. Uh, and from that, you can understand to what extent they are the main obstacle okay, in front of the people to bring about democracy to the Middle East. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for, again, extremely enlightening uh, speech. Uh, I also am happy that uh, your speech so very well fitted to what Mr. Halevi said, that maybe you met in advance to make uh, some arrangements, who is going to say what. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, uh, Ahmed Mahir, who is uh, unfortunately not present here with us, the third guest from Egypt, if he would be so keen uh, supporter of uh, General Sisi, but that's even uh, for my deeper regret that he is not here to, to say that. Get me wrong, I have no position. It's no, 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 I know, no. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm quoting your Egyptian uh, friends. Okay, maybe it's time for, for uh, the public to ask uh, their questions. I already see one. I think you can use the microphone if you okay, wish okay. or, okay. Entirely, entirely, hundred percent certain. But it's sorry, but it's not the same. No, it's, it's uh, a recording. You know, it's for recording. Uh, you will be recorded for. I don't want to be recorded. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, how would you see the future of Khaled Mashal? What, in our, in your opinion, are his options? Thank you. is no longer in Syria. It has no contacts with the Syrians anymore. They don't receive support from the Syrians. And they are uh, opposed to the, um, the, uh, the policy that uh, Bashar Assad has, uh, uh, has uh, taken upon himself and his uh, plan to uh, fight against the uh, others inside his own country. So this has nothing to do with that. You're asking about the future of Khaled Mashal. Yes. Um, I think that uh, Khaled Mashal uh, has a very, very clear um, personal aim in mind. I think he would like to become the future leader of the Palestinian Authority and the Palestinian National Movement. I think he's a very capable individual. I think his uh, movement apparently is undergoing a very, very difficult time. Hamas is isolated from all sides. In addition to Syria cutting off any help, the Iranians have uh, more or less disowned him. The Egyptian authorities believe that Hamas is uh, in uh, collusion with the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, which they probably are, because Hamas is a branch of the Muslim Brotherhood in the Arab world. So it could well be that uh, if uh, the uh, moves of the present uh, regime in Egypt taking against the Muslim Brotherhood will reach a certain level and we will also spill over into the Gaza Strip. It could well be that the Egyptians will take care, so to speak, of the Hamas and will uh, defang them as a movement, in which case, of course, Khaled Mashal uh, would suffer uh, uh, his political demise. But on the other hand, it could well be that in a situation such as that, Khaled Mashal would, Khaled Mashal would jump ship and would uh, assume a mantle of take over the Palestinian Authority because of his own personality. And the fact of the matter is that of all the uh, variety of uh, candidates to uh, fill in the 
colourful of all. So uh, that's one more drama which is left to be seen amongst the many other things which we have mentioned this afternoon. Thank you. Are there some more questions? Actually, then I have a question for Mr. Benotman. Uh, you said many things that were very new for me. Uh, there is one particular thing I wanted to ask uh, about. Uh, you mentioned that uh, there are Middle Eastern governments that are very heavily dependent on uh, Western or even Israeli support today, more than um, ever before. Can you elaborate on that a bit? Which governments are these and uh, in what sense they are dependent on the Western uh, support? Without talking about specific countries by name, you know, but just if you look at the region. Yeah, I know, I know exactly. <laughs> good, good luck, anyway, nice try. But it's, um, I said, you know, two different, either dependency or interdependency, you know, but it's now, if you look at the region, okay, for instance, let's, let's talk about Libya, my country, okay, with the absence of the security service and the military institutions as well, And problems comes from everywhere, especially from the, down to the south. Okay. A, to a cer in a certain period, you know, just to control, not to control, but just to minimize. Let's put it this way: the threat comes from the different threats, either traditional one or non-traditional security threats, coming from the south, including smuggling cocaine, and terrorist groups, small arms smuggling, you name it, everything, human traffic and other activities as well. A, uh, for instance, France played a major role from Niger okay, to reduce that threat at a very crucial and critical moment, for instance. I know maybe the first time I heard that because it wasn't mentioned in the public, but I'm aware of exactly what's going on there. Okay? It's the same thing. If you talk about Egypt now and what's going on in, in Sinai, which is a real threat because there is very strong possibility, you know, for spillover to Cairo and Alexandria, which is me like more uh, populated and um, urban areas, will be targeted by terrorist activities. And we know the um, peace treaty between Israel and Egypt, 1979, with the security attachment to it, it's really, you know, uh, I think to a certain extent because of the divided of the areas A, B, C, Uh, it has to be like with a very strong under, mutual understanding and cooperation with the Israelis to allow the Egyptians, you know, to increase their presence right near the border and to fight against a lot of terrorist groups coming some from, from Gaza, some of them from, from uh, Sinai itself. And according to my information, I think there is about maybe 15 different groups acting there in Sinai, which they constitute from 6,000 to 8,000 members okay so th this is kind of the of the of the issues uh in general i don't want to go deep you know but it's and i give you even an example outside this topic which is the relation between israel and turkey you know when the when the turks they've lost their airplane budget it's it took them like uh, an exceptional or unacceptable, let's say, time to find out exactly what happened. It was a shock and a shame as well. For the Turks. Yes, for that. Because the prestige or the people, how they perceived, you know, the, the Turkey, Turkish military establishment, beyond that. But I think, I'm, not, I'm certain, not saying, you know, because of the lack of cooperation with the Israelis, which used to be there, they suffered a lot. Had the relation still as before, I think it might look like a few hours to find out exactly what happened. Thank you. Maybe that's uh, my question for uh, Mr. Halevi. Oh, sorry, there is a question. Uh, there are two more questions. Okay, I will not ask my questions now. So first, uh, Irena Karosova and then the lady in uh, black. Much. I would like to. Uh, have one comment, two questions, one comment about the Egyptian speaker, why he's not here. Uh, I was moderating him yesterday in the morning and he said that he is actually accused by the authorities that he's a spy 
and that uh, fitting with an Israeli former Mossad chief, simply the situation would get even worse. So that's the reason, I think, why he's not here. Uh, and my question, uh, I would like to ask Mr. Halevi, if you have more of a headache because of what's going on in Syria or on, on Sinai, what do you think is a bigger problem uh, con uh, from the Israeli perspective? And uh, to the Libyan speaker, I would like to ask you, to what extent, uh, because I'm not really following so much close to what's going on in Libya, to what extent is still Libya kind of an arsenal of weapons for various uh, terrorist organizations in the Arab world? Thank you. Let's collect more questions. I think the lady in black uh, dress is also. Uh, I'm Daniela Richterova of the Slovak Atlantic uh, Commission and of the Globsec Forum. I have one brief comment and then a question. The comment is about um, security sector reform and, the, and, and which you've described uh, um, in your speech. Uh, I come from a country that, that underwent uh, revolution uh, 20 years ago, yet its security services are best known for kidnapping the president's son. And uh, up until now, we still don't have an effective way of overseeing what our services do. So it takes a while, and uh, we've been struggling with it and probably still will be in the upcoming decades. I don't want to speak for the Czech Republic, but I think that uh, security sector reform in more ways than one would be in order um, as well. Um, my question to, is to Mr. Halevi, and I'd like to ask about um, how you think that the Arab Spring has affected uh, Mossad's uh, contacts, partnerships in the Middle East, because there were a number of services in the Middle East that the Mossad has had a long relationship with. How is that going right now? And how has um, Mossad's ability to collect human intelligence, um, anywhere from Damascus to, um, um, to Casablanca, changed? Um, is, is the Mossad still capable of going to these countries when they're in turmoil and collecting the intelligence that it needs in order to protect its borders? Um, your questions are very interesting, and I would have liked to answer them. But I have two answers which I think will not satisfy you, but uh, I will nevertheless give them to you. The one is that I left uh, my organization uh, about, uh, just about 10 years ago, 11 years ago actually, and I'm not uh, very previous to the way we collect information now in the, in the Middle East. Um, all I can tell you is that generally speaking from the impression I have, and I have an impression obviously, I think we're doing very well. So um, if you ask me uh, how has uh, we been influenced, um, I suppose there have been changes in the way we operate. But I think the changes have been uh, uh, prevalent with the conditions on the ground. I'd like to say something more. You asked me uh, a question about the... Oh, the what is, which is the bigger headache, yes. Um, when I became head of the Mossad in the first three days, I realized that I could not prioritize my headaches. Um, <laughs> and therefore, I had to deal with the headaches, uh, I think, uh, on a parallel basis. Um, there are diff but what are the redeeming feature is there are different kinds of headaches. It's not the same headache, so it makes life more interesting from that point of view, <laughs> both medically and also operationally. I think that uh, the um, the situation in Egypt, in the Sinai is a very dangerous situation, uh, and uh, it's a dangerous situation first and foremost for Egypt. And uh, coming back uh, to something that uh, my uh, colleague uh, on the right has uh, said, but I would like to put it in a different way. Um, the world does not stand still and wait for 
countries who undergo revolutions to get their house in order in order to decide whether they want to intervene for their own interests. And the same goes for non-state actors like terrorist organizations. If Egypt were not able, during the revolution, at the height of the revolution, to continue to protect itself from the entry of uh, terrorist groups into Egypt, uh, Egypt would not have been able to survive as a, uh, as a viable uh, state. Uh, at the time that uh, President Mubarak was being deposed, at the time when uh, people were uh, demonstrating Tahrir Square, Al-Qaeda groups were trying to enter Egypt. The Iranians were trying to infiltrate into Egypt. Uh, arms were being smuggled and attempts were, of arms smuggling were being carried on from Sudan into Egypt so they could reach the Sinai. And there had to be some kind of uh, capability on the spot to deal with these threats, which are threats which are, do not relate to whether who is at the helm in, in Cairo. They react to the fact that you cannot let a state disintegrate in any state or form. And the only way you can do this is to maintain a capability in the security field. And here I'd like to say something more general, ladies and gentlemen, and I know probably some of the things which are being said here this afternoon are not palatable to you, but more than that, they seem to be remote. So I'd like to bring this little home to you uh, in a way which will connect your way of life here in Prague and in other countries in Western Europe and what we are talking about. The terrorist threat here is an international terrorist threat. The terrorist threat now which we are facing, which you are facing, which you are facing together, is a threat from not a single entity. It's not as if terror today has an address. There is no address to terror. There's no headquarters of the International Terrorist uh, Foundation, organization, or movement which is, which is conducting a series of acts of war against Britain, against France, against Czechos, the Czech Republic, against the Slovakian Republic, and so forth. The groups who are involved in terror to now are like an amoebic type uh, and phenomenon. And when you have an amoebic type phenomenon, terrorism can spill over very easily from one country to another, from one region into another, and you can find yourself with Al-Qaeda cells which are in France and in Germany and in other places. The 9-11 operation originated from a cell in Hamburg, in Germany. It did not originate in, on the, in the United States. But it also had people who were in the United States who trained as pilots in Miami and who then took over the aircraft which were being, were, while they were in the air, on 9-11 and took these aircraft and transformed them from aircraft into munitions, into a means of uh, destruction. To transform an aircraft into, a, uh, into a, uh, an, a, an element of war is something beyond, I think, the, anything that people here in this room would have even countenanced or thought of. So you must realize that when we're talking about this necessity to deal with terrorism, the only way to deal with terrorism is to have a system, an international system of security and intelligence apparatuses which operate as far as possible all over the globe and who interrelate to each other and who exchange information and sometimes carry out joint uh, operations so that tomorrow morning you won't find an, airport, uh, an aircraft being hijacked here at uh, Václav Havel, Havel Airport in, 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 in Prague, or of Heathrow in London, or Charles de Gaulle in Paris, and so on and so on and so on. This is the kind of threat which the 21st century is meeting. And therefore, in such a configuration, the only way to be able to have a minimal capability to deal with these threats is to have all these groups in place, whether it is or is not entirely compatible with uh, pure democracy the way you have lived it 
the way we live it in Israel and so forth. But there comes a moment when you have to make very, very grave and serious decisions and very difficult decisions and decisions which relate to human lives and which relate to problems which I don't want even to, 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 to describe them to you because they're so horrendous. But heads of state and uh, prime ministers will have in the next years to come take instant decisions in order to avert terrorist threats. And sometimes the, uh, the act of averting a terrorist threat will be an act which will also involve the loss of human life. We are right in the middle of this war at the moment, ladies and gentlemen. We're not anywhere near end it, the end of it. And therefore, in a conditions like these, what we're talking about is not something far away which relate to countries in the Middle East and the way they run their, their, their shops, but it's related to the question whether the world as it is today is sufficiently uh, organized to deal with the major threat which it has to deal with. And I would tell you that I don't think that we should rest on our laurels. We are far from being satisfied with the way things are today. But without what we've been discussing this afternoon, it could be much, much worse. Thank you. There is still one uh, question waiting for being answered by Mr. Benoka. Regarding Libya, yeah, the, uh, the weapons desperate, yeah. I think, I think it's, um, it's well known because of the collapse of the regime. And as I mentioned, you know, like it's, there's, Libya always, I'm saying, there's a government, but there is no state. The main blocks which constitute states not there Libya now. So it's very hard and difficult to control exactly the, what is left of the army, including weapons, all sorts of weapons. But just to give you an example, I think it's, um, it has been documented, the Libyan weapons contributing to a 12 different conflicts in 12 different countries, which is not Libya. In recent times? Yeah, now, until today, still. So... It's, 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 it's a huge. Then the other issue is because of um, Syria. Myself, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of the Syrian revolution. It's a different debate, but I think it's, uh, it's really a shame if anyone compromised with al-Assad. Okay? No matter what's going to happen now, it's too late, but I think the guy should, you know, has no place in the future of Syria whatsoever. But anyway, because of that and the absence of the government, and there's like huge support in Libya for the Syrian revolution, some people, which is non-state actors, some of them has a very strong tie with terrorist groups, they establish a network of training camps in Libya, facilitating the movement from thousands of Tunisians, and sometimes others, to Libya for training purposes, and then all the way from Libya, Turkey, then to Syria. And when you're involved in these activities, and you are not a state, non-state actor, there is no rules or code of conduct, you know? So that means it's an open market for everybody to use it the way we, you know, they would like to use it. A problems happened in Tunisia, including the assassination of uh, Brahmi. People, after they assassinated him, immediately they went to Libya when the authority just went after them. Then they returned back, then back to Libya. Some of them, they get and obtain their trains in Libya. They've been trained there. Then they moved back to Tunisia with the weapons. It's just a few examples, but I'm aware of worse than this. The attack against the American diplomatic mission in Benghazi and the killing of the American ambassador, there were three Yemenis involved in that attack. And within 48 hours, they managed to go all the way down to the south to northern Mali before the French intervention in Serval operation and including an Egyptian involved in the planning. So it's just to give you like a taste of what's going on, but which is I'm not willing to tell you it's worse than this. It's a very serious issue. Problem is the government, uh, first of all, like failed to recognize what's going on in Libya. And every time when there is even a domestic terrorist uh, act in Libya itself, they deliberately you know, try to avoid to use the term terrorism. It's incident, whatever, which is, I think, nonsense for everybody when you're facing this kind of activities in your own country. So it's not going to help. The parliament as well, 
Libya failed as well to deal with the issue because of uh, many obstacles, including some elements they support other uh, 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 radical militias. So that's, that's the, the situation which is going to involve, I think, at one stage, sooner or later, an international response to sort out the problem. Thanks indeed. Sean Cleary, I wasn't going to say anything, but the way in which the conversation has gone prompts me to ask an impossible question. And I'm, if I may, going to direct it to you. The, I think there are three problems in this space. Um, the first is the protean character of, let's say, asymmetric threat in its broader sense. Uh, most of it will be terrorist in character. It will take on many different forms. And it won't necessarily come from one ideological uh, point of departure. The second problem is the level of integration that we've seen over the last decade and longer uh, between international crime syndicates operating preeminently uh, for financial entrepreneurial purposes and terrorist networks in a variety of spaces, extending certainly across four continents and maybe more. And the extent of the linkages that have been forged, not least because of information and communications technology between these particular groups, which make it extraordinarily difficult um, to be able to stay ahead of the game if one's responsibility is to try to manage security within those parameters. And that, of course, takes us into the furore around Mr. Snowden and everything related to that, and that brings us into issues of legitimacy um, in respect of state activity in the context of the necessities for surveillance in order to be able to act pre preemptively in respect of the character of the threats themselves. So around all of that, one of the larger questions, it seems to me, for discussions at events like this, which I said on the first day gave me the sort of awkward impression that we had a teleological definition of transition, i.e. it went from revolt to democracy, and that there seemed somehow to be an assumption that that was in some fashion linear, which it doesn't seem to me it ever has been and is unlikely to be under present circumstances. But the circumstance that you've described, I think, is absolutely right um, in respect of the whole of a region extending certainly from the Mediterranean, I'd argue, right into Central Asia, which is going to be characterized by very high degrees of instability for a considerable period of time with a tremendous amount of knock-on effects of probably largely unforeseeable character. Obviously, one can do scenarios around them, but they're not foreseeable in any fashion. And I have two questions, therefore. To what extent should one be warning publics about the difficulty of the transitional period through which we're currently passing in order to modulate expectation more closely to plausible reality? And to what extent, as part of that particular debate, do we need a better taxonomy of terror, if you will, or asymmetric threat, if you choose, to be communicated in ways that... ...which uh, resonated in the world it was in 1998 when uh, two American embassies in Dar es Salaam and in Nairobi were attacked uh, almost uh, simultaneously within minutes with a uh, serious loss of life and casualties in both places. And shortly after that, there was a short, that was shortly after I took over as head of the Mossad. And um, a short while after that, uh, I met with the director of the CIA, uh, George Tennant, a good friend of mine, uh, not in Washington. We met uh, in a third country because both of us were busy in all kinds of activities and we couldn't have the time to travel one to each other's country. And we sat down and talked about the significance of those events and whether it was now the time to warn the public, as you say, in a more extensive manner. And this on the background of a clear understanding of ours that in order to 
deal with the threats as we thought they were developing without knowing anything about specific uh, operations which were uh, uh, being hatched. It would be necessary to go into legislation which would give uh, the, uh, um, the executive authorities in, in states uh, certain uh, uh, powers which were um, incompatible with the way of life, the way of life, way of life was being uh, led. And we concluded that it would not be possible to get the political levels in our countries to go along with this because they would say to us, look, before we go to Congress and we want to pass the Patriot Act, bring me the uh, nuts and bolts and the, uh, and the evidence. We want the evidence. Just as today, Congress wants to see the evidence of uh, why we can prove that Assad used chemical weapons, okay? And in intelligence, as you probably know, intelligence is not just one chunk of information which gets to you one day. It is a, a whole uh, uh, variety of bits and pieces of information, snippets here and snippets there, and you, they, you put them together in a jigsaw puzzle and then you see it. But this is a professional, a very professional uh, uh, way of looking at it, and you have to have professional capabilities. And when you do talk to members of Congress with all due respect to them, or members of Parliament, and you want to describe to them how it is that you put the intelligence picture together, after a short while, either they nod off because they're tired and it's very tiresome to listen to it, or they lose uh, the capability of following it all. <laughs> and then they say, well, this is not evidence. We want, you know, we want somebody to come and say, that we saw President Assad take the telephone and give the order to Mahir, his brother, to uh, carry out a, 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 an attack, a, a chemical attack in, uh, in uh, wherever it is. And then we had another source, and he was sitting with Mayer, and he reported <laughs> that Mayer received this information, and he heard Mayer give the order to the uh, people on the spot to launch the, the attack. And then we had the third source, who was sitting right next to the gunner, and he saw him how he took the canister, and he put the canister into the, into, into the, uh, into the um, piece of artillery, the gun, and it shot. That is proof. That is proof. Less of that. Oh, no, no. We don't have conclusive proof. The word conclusive. Uh, I, the only thing that I know of which is conclusive in life is death. Death <laughs> is conclusive. Yep. Uh, short of that, nothing is conclusive. Now, I'm saying this uh, because I think you're right. I think the public should be informed. But I'll put it this way. The public will only be informed by an act of terror. When 7-7 took place in London, within the days, there was legislation in all areas related to uh, investigation, to detentions, to all kinds of things. And there was a small window of opportunity of four weeks in which the government could pass Acts of Parliament on this. And things which go went beyond four weeks was gone. When you had 9-11, the United States could pass the Patriot Act. And now, after all the revelations, you know, of Mr. Stoddard and so forth, so I will, I unfortunately, I have to conclude that it will need another terrorist act, probably a big terrorist act, to shake the, the body politic in the United States to take action which they should have taken in advance, which which they cannot take because there is no uh, public sentiment to do this. That is the, 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 um, the price that democracy pays. Democracy is not just sitting and uh, having the, uh, the, uh, the uh, joy of, in, of having uh, government of the people, by the people, for the people, having human rights, having uh, citizens' rights, having uh, uh, the rights of a, uh, of a person who is detained to get in his lawyer, and so on and so forth. Democracy is also a system whereby, unless there are major attacks upon it, it does not uh, cooperate with measures which are designed to help preventing terrorist acts. And democracy does not take responsibility for the lives of those people who are sacrificed because in the uh, con conflict 
between human rights and citizen rights and terrorist uh, activities, you always give the, uh, the, uh, the advantage to the human rights until proven otherwise. Well, I, I'm sad to say this evening, in this con one of the concluding events of this uh, Forum 2000, that I'm not sanguine about the future. I don't want to be like a prophet. Uh, the prophecy in these days is a consigned to fools, and I very often try my best not to appear as a fool. And in this, within this context, I don't want to say there's going to be a terrorist act tomorrow morning or so forth. I don't know. But I do know that as we go on, and as memory fades, ladies and gentlemen, and memory fades, people will hop back to the necessity of protecting the rights of the individual. And this will go on until the point when something will happen, something will snap, and people will get up and say, but why didn't the government uh, tell us in advance? And why didn't they have the legislation there? They didn't have it because you, the citizen, didn't cooperate in this. You didn't want this to happen. You, Mr. John Citizen, didn't want this to happen because you thought that human rights were superseded anything else until something happened, like 9-11 or 7-7 or the bomb on Madrid, and then you rethink it. That, unfortunately, is the world we live in, for better or for worse, and we have to uh, resign ourselves to it, and I think we have to realize that uh, at this uh, late hour of the day, um, we have to go back to our homes and to wherever it is with some more sanguine thoughts about the state of uh, our society and the state of humanity in the 21st century. It's not as simple as it seemed a day before we met. Thank you. We are coming close to the end of this session, so we have time for one or two more questions. Please, uh, so Peter Brod, and then this man with a uh, bow tie. My name is Peter Brod. I would have uh, one question for each of the panelists, uh, Mr. Benotman. You seem to advocate, uh, as most uh, democratically minded people do, uh, the civilian control of secret services, democratic civilian control of secret services, secret intelligence services. But under the circumstances prevailing in the Muslim world right now, where we see that uh, the democratic ballot occasionally brings forward uh, governments that are led, for example, by the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, what, are we do then? what are we to do then? I mean, uh, if democracy brings forward such governments as the one uh, in Egypt, do you still advocate that they control the secret intelligence services? And to uh, Ambassador Halevi, I would like you to say something about the role of Russia in the Middle East. Uh, you said that it is necessary for uh, secret services to cooperate in the fight against terrorism. Uh, Russia on the political level right now, for example, in connection with the Syrian conflict seems to complicate things rather than to contribute to a solution. Uh, do you feel that on the secret level, on the level of uh, the cooperation of secret services, it is more forthcoming than it is on the international diplomatic uh, scene? Thank you very much. I have a question for Mr. Halevi. Just to ask, the intelligence services, as you describe them, don't you think they dangerously resemble some of the George Orwell's dystopias? And don't you think that it actually can get out of the hand? And an infringement on civil liberties is just as a sacrifice as a human life? What was the last sentence? Uh, don't you think that infringement and infringe infringement on civil liberties is just as much as a sacrifice as a human life, as loss of human life. Infringement on. A question? Yes. Do you think it is right to sacrifice human life for human rights? Do you Can think you take it upon yourself to say that because you want your human rights, somebody else must die? Do you think it is the right, the other way around? 
No, I ask you this way around. You're asking me you my ask question. Me that way around. I ask you this way around. Do you stand up and say human rights are so sacred that for human rights it is right to sacrifice life? Is that what you're saying? Do you think it is better to live in fear? No, I'm and asking you a question. Answer me. A, don't ask me a question. Answer a question with a question. No? I'm, 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 I'm very. A simple question. Do you think? that it is more sacred to preserve human rights and to, you can sacrifice other people's lives for your human rights. I'm very afraid to answer you right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have, I have a suggestion. You will have the, uh, the, the chance to have the last word of this session because you will think about it until the end. We will have, uh, we'll have uh, our guests' uh, uh, answers and then you will have the concluding word, okay? Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Just if I may, may answer on your behalf, the answer is crystal clear, no. <laughs> Back to your question is, uh, I think, yeah, this is one of the main problems with no a, um, traditions of democratic practices in, the, in most of the Middle East. Uh, and I agree with you, this is one of the main threats to the outcomes of the Arab Spring if uh, non-democratic groups or political parties, they utilize the chance to create something else. But the problem is, shall we hold them accountable because of their attention, which is not prevailed yet, or we need to wait, or sometimes to act as like a foolish, until they grab the whole state and nation and we have to suffer because of that. It's, it's, it's a very difficult issue, but I think it's extremely difficult now for anyone to try to think to control entire state. I'm talking about the, 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 the Arab Spring nations, the five of them. It's extremely difficult. You have to go through war to do that. You have to do it that way. Because a lot of things, which is very good, has been introduced to the sea now, okay, which is mainly... The main problem, I think, in the Middle East is the individual. I'm Arab, Libyan, from Tripoli, but I can tell you, individualism is not, not individualism. Let's stay away from the ISM, you know. Individual, the existence of the individual, we're still struggling for that. To convince people, I'm not talking about government, by the way, here, even societies themselves, you know, the existence of something called individual, a human. Okay? You cannot sacrifice individuals because of something you think it's the interest of the society or maybe the state. You have to strike a balance between these two issues. So I think now one of the good things happened because of the Arab Spring. We start to see, especially Libya now, you know, the, the resurrection of Libyans outside the framework of state, okay? which, is, which is very important. I think this power and this force make it very difficult for any radical group Okay, or extremist group, if they think they can rule the, 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 the entire state. And what happened in Egypt, which is something new, you know, something that shocked everybody, you know, which maybe you can call it the politics of streets, when people, they just bypass all the legal channels because they think someone just blocked it and manipulated it, and they went outside to the streets, and they make themselves not just visible, but very visible. Okay, then the army took chance of that, and they said, okay, we don't need to take the whole nation to a civil war, so we have to support the, the, the will of the people. Why I'm saying this? Because I think a lot of Islamists, they fail to understand when it comes to constitution, it's not about the legal process. It's about vision. It's about the will of the people, which is outside all the political establishment or structure or regime, or whatever you call it. And you have to understand that. And here it's a big failure to the Muslim Brotherhood when they fail to understand, you know, post-conflict constitution should be like, you know, tasked to a very skillful hand outside the framework of law itself. It's beyond that. It's not about majority. No. So I'm comfortable because of what happened in Egypt. It doesn't mean I'm taking side, by the way. I believe in democracy. I believe in the, you know, results of the elections. But this, this is a very, very important question. Thank you for, 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 I think, for asking this question. Because shall we wait for someone to serve his term until he destroyed the entire nation? 
because of his, let's say, you know, uh, someone with his government, incapable to be a governor, incapable to be a ruler, even if he was elected. So shall we ha should we wait for his, you know, term until he finished four or five years, or the people, they can present themselves in different ways and to make it, you know, like visible for everybody, this is the will and the power of the people outside the official channels, and you can act based on that. So yes, I think there is a real threat, and I don't have now crystal clear answer, honestly, about this issue, because it's still ongoing process and it's very fluid situation, but there is a real danger to use democracy against democracy, using democratic mechanism against democratic values. Yes, indeed, there is, there is a real threat, but one of the issues now I think it was very important we shouldn't allow any single government, you know, to take control of the security and intelligence apparatus. It should be divided between the parliament and the government. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Halevi, we will have to leave very soon. Uh, would you like to uh, answer, answer short? Answer short? Okay. Um, we'll know very soon, uh, Mr. Broad, uh, as the uh, solution which uh, President Putin proposed for Syria, as it begins to uh, unfold, if it unravels or it uh, becomes something, uh, a model for the future. We'll know within a couple of weeks, and then you'll have your answer. Thank you. And now we have the reply of the gentleman, which he prefers, human <laughs> life or human rights? What you're saying is, in the long run, we're all dead. <laughs> I'm afraid we are all dead uh, anyway, in the long time. Uh, uh, let me conclude this session. Uh, all I can say is that uh, Ahmed uh, Maher, who was supposed to be here, uh, traded his right to speak here for his security back in Egypt. So his answer to you would be that uh, human rights are not as valuable as his own life. Uh, but this is my interpretation. Uh, he chose not to speak here. And his official uh, statement is that uh, he is apologizing to everyone here uh, that he would not be present here without giving any reasons. Uh, thank you to uh, my, sorry, first of all, thanks to my guest, uh, Mr. Ephraim Halevi, ex-chief of uh, Mossad and of, uh, of uh, National Security Council of Israel. Thank you very much. And of course... Uh, And of course, also great thanks to Noman Bedotman from uh, UK and Libya, from uh, uh, Kiliam uh, uh, Think Tank, president of Kiliam Think Tank. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. And, and of course, thanks to all of you who came to listen to this uh, debate and of course to all of those who made it possible uh, and to, to those who organized the uh, Forum 2000. Thank you very much and goodbye.